I'll be reading today from John chapter 15. So if you'd like to open your Bibles up to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Hear now God's word. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered together, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Dan. Good morning, everybody. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, my name is Sam, uh, one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to get to preach that wonderful passage this morning. So before we do, let's, let's pray. Father, we need you. Every hour we need you, and right now is no different to that. We are so needy. Father, we need this passage to inform the way we live our Christian lives, and so we pray that you would reveal it to us by your grace, by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are continuing in what is known as the Farewell Discourse in John. It's from chapters 13 to 17, we've just struck chapter 15, Jesus' words to his disciples on the night before he will be crucified for our sins. Everything in this section, I think, as I've been reflecting on it, is the very essence, I think, of what is meant by special revelation. Special revelation is that kind of revelation, that kind of knowledge of God that we cannot get apart from him telling us. You know, there's none of this from, you know, in, in this farewell discourse that you can just kind of find out yourself. You know, by looking at creation, there's no kind of experiment you might do in a science lab and come up with any of this. If we are to know these things, which are precious things, we will only know them if God self-discloses them to, to us. And by God's grace, He has. I've quoted this a few weeks or some weeks ago. Puritan Thomas Goodwin calls this section a window into the heart of Christ. I reckon we've probably found that, haven't we? Week after week, a window into the heart of Christ. I don't think there is in the Bible a more extended and searching treatment and, 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 and disclosure of the heart of Christ than these chapters. And so as we enter into chapter 15 now, we're invited again. To enter into this conversation, these words really, that Jesus is giving his disciples on this night before he will die. It doesn't take a Bible degree, I don't think, to notice that our passage, in our passage, Jesus is speaking in metaphor, right? I hope you picked up on that. Um, I did, and that's been very helpful. Um, The purpose of a metaphor, of course, is to, well, it's pretty obvious, we use metaphors all the time, Um, it's to give us a kind of vivid picture of something so that we can kind of grasp kind of more deeply maybe or feel more of what the person's trying to communicate. So if I say to you, you are a couch potato, um, I actually don't really know what that means, but I I think it means that the way you sit there looks to me like a potato and that's I mean, that's not a compliment, is it? So you wouldn't take it that way. If I said to you, you are a wet blanket, 
and you're like, that doesn't sound good because no one wants a wet blanket. Um, if I say to you, life is a highway, you go, yeah, I'm going to ride it. <laughs> That's what you would think. Um, we would probably don't really actually know what that means. Um, yeah, here's a popular one. Last one to the car is a, a rotten egg. Isn't that interesting? I wonder what that actually means. <laughs> you know? It's like, I think we must just assume that, well, I don't know. I wouldn't even let a rotten egg in my car anyway. So, and, and I think we just probably know that if there are eggs headed to a car, the rotten ones would be the last ones to get to the car. Any case, <laughs> metaphors. <laughs> Having confused everyone on what a metaphor is, I think they're meant to make things clearer. I'm just thinking right now, not all metaphors make things clearer. Jesus is better than that, and he is using a parable, he's using a metaphor, if you like, to give us a vivid picture of the Christian life. Jesus says, I am the true vine. There are branches on that vine. You are the branches. He says, God the Father is the vine dresser, or literally the farmer. He's the one who tends to the vine and its branches. And Jesus draws on this picture that he wants to put before us so that we might understand, I think, in a vivid way, the Christian life. The essence, I think, of the Christian life. Now that I think it's such a blessing. That's amazing. And yet, I don't think that that is the purpose of the passage. That picture of the Christian life is a means to the purpose of the passage. And Jesus tells us the purpose of the passage. In the last verse that we're going to be looking at, look at verse 11. It says that. Jesus tells us why he's speaking. He says, these things I have spoken to you, right? This, this metaphor that I've given to you. So, these things I've spoken to you, that, so purpose statement, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So two things there, reasons to give you this metaphor of the essence, I think, of the Christian life, two things, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete or full, which the second one really does flow from the first one, doesn't it? If you have Jesus' own joy in you, well, of course, then your joy is full. It is absolutely complete. It might sound strange to our ears, I think, that to think that God is a joyful God. That God exists in eternity in perfect, abundant joy, happiness. Of Jonathan Edwards um, from the 18th century he thought a lot about these kinds of things, and, and, he, and he wrote this. He said, part of God's fullness, which he communicates to us, which means he passes on to us, is his happiness. This happiness consists in enjoying and rejoicing in himself. So does all the creature's happiness. So God has, in all of eternity, been, in a sense, rejoicing in himself, in that which brings most and ultimate joy, which is him. And since he is triune, the Father, Son, Spirit, enjoying triune fellowship one with another. This is the eternal delight, if you like, of the Trinity. So the Father will say things when the Son is on earth, like, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. I am so happy with my Son. And we've seen this with Jesus throughout the Gospel of John. He longs to, he loves the Father. He longs to bring glory to the Father, to point people to the Father, the joy that He has in the Father. Heaven itself is a very happy place, isn't it? Well, it ought to be. It ought to be in our minds. Matthew 25, Jesus tells that parable of the, the, the talents and, and the, what, what does He say to the people who do well in that parable? He says to this, the Master says to these servants, enter into the joy of your Master. John Piper writes about this, he says, There is only one fountain of lasting joy, the overflowing gladness of God in God. Without beginning and without ending, without source and without cause, without help or assistance, the spring is eternally self-replenishing. From this unceasing fountain of joy flow all grace and all joy in the universe. God is a happy God. It's actually for the joy that's set before the Lord Jesus 
that he endures the cross. Do you remember Hebrews 12, verse 2? And so the Lord Jesus, from that passage, is a happy saviour. He, lo- he delights to save sinners. Sinners are not a burden coming to him with their issues. He's a happy and joyful saviour. And so Jesus says to his disciples now, in this moment, I'm about to depart from you, that he's been saying that. I'm about to leave. I'm going to the cross. And after that, I'm going to the Father. But you do not need to face the days that are ahead of you with some kind of glum disappointment and frustration. You can actually, and I'm saying, telling you these things, that you can actually have my joy. You can face what is coming tomorrow with joy, my joy. He would say that to us this morning. You can face the days that are ahead of you in this life, with the joy of the Lord, Jesus' own joy. And he's giving us a picture of the Christian life to that end. So I'm praying that as we walk away from this morning, we would walk away with a kind of astounded joy at just what it means to be a Christian. It's a wonderful thing. So let's get into it. Verse 1 begins like this. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. This is the last of the seven I am statements in John's gospel. Jesus says, I am the true vine. In the Old Testament, Israel was often referred to as a vine. We heard a passage earlier read from Psalm 80, where, where God is um, the vine dresser again, and Israel is a vine that is taken out of Egypt and planted by God. And yet, despite God's work on the vine, it ends up producing no fruit. It's ravaged by beasts. And so, um, another good example is Isaiah chapter 5, where, again, God is depicted as caring for the vineyard, clearing the ground, planting the vineyard, nourishing it, watering it. That's what God's doing for the vineyard, which is Israel. But then God says this in verse 4, Isaiah 5, What more was there to do for my vineyard? That I have not done in it. When I looked, sorry, when I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes, like sour grapes, bad fruit? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. I shall not. It shall not be pruned, or hoed. And briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Just total judgment because of the lack of fruit in the vine. Actually, every time in the Old Testament that Israel is depicted as a vine, it's followed by, and you didn't bear fruit, and therefore judgment came. So when Jesus says now, I am the true vine, What's he saying? He's saying, I'm the true Israel. I'm the true Israelite. I'm the one that comes, planted by God, but I bear fruit. I do not deserve judgment. He is the true, final, ultimate fulfillment of all that Israel was meant to be. So that's Jesus. I am the true vine. Then there's the father in that first verse. He is the vine dresser or the farmer. So he's the one who carefully watches over, protects, nourishes the vine, does whatever is necessary so that the vine might produce fruit. That's the Father. Okay, the next verse shows how he does that. Verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, that is the Father, takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So there's two kinds of branches attached to the vine, And that actually determines the response of the vine dresser to those branches. Are they bearing fruit or are they not bearing fruit? So the first branches, they do not bear fruit and they are taken away. Now, who is he talking about? Let's trip some people up because um, it's sometimes thought, well, here's evidence of true believers falling away from God. Okay, so this is an example of apostasy. The sin of apostasy, that they were once attached to the vine, in the vine, because Jesus says, these branches are in me. And yet they're removed. This is an example of that. People falling away from the Lord and that that happens. True believers can fall away. I think there's a bunch of reasons why that's not what's going on here. One is that it never says that these branches ever bore fruit. It doesn't say that, it doesn't picture them as once they were 
healthy and abiding in the vine and bearing much fruit, but after a while they died off and were cut away. It doesn't say that. Secondly, Jesus has made explicit statements that have promised that, that he won't allow that to happen for his people. So remember John 6? All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Or think of John 10. My sheep, Jesus says, hear my voice, and I know them, and they what? They follow me. They do. That's what they do. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hands. Like, disciples of mine, follow me. That's, that's the marker of disciples, true disciples. They actually follow. They bear fruit. He gives them what? Eternal life. It's not like a temp- temporary life that could be kind of won or lost. This is eternal life that goes on forever, and they never, ever perish. Well, these branches perish. So this is just a good principle. When it comes to parables or metaphors in the Bible, we've got, we got to make sure, this is just principle in general, helpful, hopefully, um, is that if you take what the metaphor is trying to communicate and don't ever try to stretch one. Don't stretch out a parable so it says 10,000 things that it wasn't kind of intended to say. Um, for example, when I said couch potato before, you might stretch that metaphor too far. You might be like, hmm, okay, so what do the dirt parts on the potato represent in the couch potato? Is it the potato chip sitting on the person's belly as they watch television? No, you're, you're going too far. You're stretching the metaphor. You think of, um, one example, prodigal, think of the prodigal son. You could walk away from the parable of the prodigal son thinking, okay, so the, the father doesn't go after his lost ones. Is that what he... So God just sits back and hopes for the best? Well, no, we know that's not the case because only a few verses earlier it says God leaves the 99 and goes after the one. See, we've got to get like the right metaphor and, and, and read into it exactly what it's trying to communicate. So when it says that these branches are in the vine, I think it's, it would be stretching the metaphor to read into that they were once fruit-bearing, abiding saints who fell away were spiritually alive and fell away. So then who are they? I actually think they describe something that we've seen very, it's actually been pretty common in John's gospel. That is, it's very possible to be connected to Jesus, but not be in Jesus. It's very possible to be near him, but not of him, not in him. It's very possible to look like a disciple, but not to actually be a disciple, to actually be dead spiritually. Remember John chapter 2 said this. This was John the Apostle's commentary of what was happening at that time. And he says, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. You go, they believed in his name. And it says, Jesus did not entrust himself to them. Well, they were connected. They were close to the vine. But Jesus knew their hearts. He knew they were all about the miracles. They were all about seeing the signs or having their own healing. They didn't actually want Jesus. They didn't want to put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus and follow him. John chapter 6 even, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, to these people, he says, speaks to them. He says, You are seeking me, not because you saw signs, which in this sense would have been a good thing, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. That's right. You just want another meal. That's what you want. Well, you're coming to me. You go, well, they're coming to him. Well, that looks good. Right? They look like good branches. You go, no. Actually, they're not. They're dead spiritually. They're coming to Jesus. But why? They're hungry. And he gave them a free meal recently. Or think of finally and ultimately of Judas himself. Could you be more connected and look more like a disciple than Judas? He was one of the twelve. But Jesus prays about this in in John 17, verse 12. Jesus says, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. See, Judas is just an excellent example. Someone connected, but not alive, spiritually. It's what we would call, I think, in our day, nominalism. 
nominalism. It's like Christian in name only. The person perhaps just banking on, will they attend church maybe? They know doctrine, but are they alive in Christ? Maybe banking on a, a childhood profession of faith. Or once I went down the front and I prayed, I raised a hand once. I had an experience at one time. Yes, but are you spiritually alive? Do you bear fruit? It says to these branches, it says that the vine dresser, he takes them away. Verse 6, if you look down, explains more of what that means. It says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Dead branches are taken away to the judgment of fire. In other words, the vine dresser can spot them. He is not fooled. Maybe to our eye, the branches look similar. He is not fooled. He sees because there's a telltale sign. There's no fruit. I imagine the branch might have presumed itself safe. I'm very close to the vine. I'm very connected to the vine. Surely judgment will come to those branches who are completely off the vine. Those ones down there on the ground. Surely not to me. Think of Matthew 7. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did not we cast out demons in your name? Do many mighty wonders in your name? And Jesus turns to them and says, Depart from me, I never knew you. Connected. Doing things in his name. But spiritually dead. A dead branch. Well, we're all in danger of that right now, aren't we? Not to rock anyone's assurance. But we're all in danger. Why? You're here. You're connected. We're at least one part of that. You're at least connected. The question this morning is, are you alive? Are you spiritually alive? So there is another kind of branch. And I pray this is all of us and we can enjoy the description of what happens with this branch. So go back to verse 2. The Christian life is a life that bears fruit. The vine dresser sees, oh, this branch is alive. And so he treats it totally differently. Although he doesn't neglect it, he doesn't go, okay, it's bearing fruit, I'll move on. He does do something. What does he do? He prunes it. You think, hmm, that does, really doesn't sound that pleasant. He's pruning things, you know, imagine scissors are sharp and I don't know if that's how you prune <laughs> vines. Is it scissors? I don't know. Scissors. It looks painful. I've never been a plant. Um, I've never had a conversation with a plant. Um, but I just imagine a plant has mixed feelings about the pruning situation. So why would a vine dresser come along to a plant that's already bearing fruit and start cutting it? Why would he do that? It tells us, actually, doesn't it? What does it say? That it may bear more fruit. That's what pruning does, doesn't it? I'm no green thumb, I don't <laughs> That is what it does, though. It prunes, the prune, it prunes, so it suffers loss that in the end, there would be more of it. So it's not hard, I think, to see how this might relate to the Christian life. I think literally every single Christian has, an, has, has stories of a pruning season in their life where it seemed like God was pruning, taking things away at work in our lives. And the Christian gets to interpret those seasons of life, not as the anger of God, let, much less his, his, his absence, his lack of care, his abandonment, but we actually get to interpret all those seasons as the loving, tender care of a vine dresser, watching over his vine. Think of Hebrews 12, verse 7 and onward says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, well, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The writer goes on, he says, He disciplines us for our good, that we may share in His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Fruit of righteousness. Hear that? 
to those who have been trained by it. The point is that God is far more committed to our holiness than our comfort. God is far more committed to us bearing fruit in our lives, spiritual fruit in our lives, than our own ease. Amy Carmichael was a, a, an Irish missionary in India for 55 years, worked in rescuing um, girls from temple prostitution. And she was reflecting on this passage once and described and, and, and wrote about you know, what, would it, what it would be like to kind of walk in on that cutting room floor and to just see the pruning of these vines. And she says this, she says, What prodigal waste it appears to see scattered on the floor the bright green leaves and the bare stem bleeding in a hundred places from the sharp knife. But with a tried and trusted husbandman, there is not a random stroke in it all. Nothing cut away which would not have been lost to keep and gain to lose. That is perfect, I think. <laughs> right no, there, there. Let me say it again. Nothing is cut away which it would not have been a loss to keep and a gain to lose. I don't know if you ever heard of this um, Mary, I think it's Mary Kondo. Anyone know that person? Right. <laughs> Some people. Um, I just thought of this this morning. I watched a little video of her. She actually helps people um, tidy their houses and actually get rid of things that they don't need, right? And do you know what the promise is? Not that you just kind of have more space. What does she promise? Joy. That's the point of this passage. She's like, joy. What sparks joy in your life? And I watched the video on how you do it. You pick up a shirt and you, you hold it, right? And you look at it. And then what you do is you listen to your body, you know. <laughs> so I'm not joking. And you listen to your body. And if your body senses joy, you keep it. That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> I tried it and I didn't feel anything. But, um, but that's not actually dissimilar to this. But except we're not trusting in our own feelings. God knows what's best for our joy. And He will eliminate all those things which are in the way. That's the joy of the Christian life. There's nothing that happens to us that we're lost from our lives that's accidental. There's no random bad luck. Our Heavenly Father is pruning with a perfect knowledge of what's good for us. And you just ask any saint, any particularly older saints, and each one will say, I think, you know, the, the best, the most fruit and the best fruit, none of them say, you know, that came on the day that everything was so good. You know, the sun was shining and it was the easiest of days. What I think almost every saint will say is, you know, the most fruit that's happened in my life spiritually, the best fruit, they came on very dark and very hard days where I had to draw near, very near to the Lord. And it was out of those that the best fruit was wrought. Um, John Patton spoke like that. He's a missionary. After spending a night in a tree, I've used this illustration before, spent a night in a tree hiding from um, people who wanted to kill him. He was a missionary in, in Vanuatu. And he reflected on that night that he spent in a tree hiding. And he said, I sat there among the branches as safe in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did the Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly to my soul than when the moonlight flickered among these chestnut leaves and the night air played on my throbbing brow as I told all my heart to Jesus. Alone, yet not alone. If it be to the glory of my God, I will not grudge to spend many nights alone in such a tree, to feel again my Savior's spiritual presence, to enjoy His consoling fellowship. He said, enjoy, right? Well, he had a prune, he had a pruning thing that happened, right? He lost a night of sleep. You know, he lost safety. He lost security. It was pruned, it was cut away. And he said, I would not grudge another, like many of those, why? Because of the fruit that it wrought. He was abiding in Christ. So verse 3, we're going to speed up a bit this soon. Jesus says this, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now there's a word play here that's it, it's obvious in the Greek. So the word for prune is kathiro. The word for clean is katharos. So it's similar. 
and commentators say, well, we're meant to kind of read them as a similar thing going on. And that's true, isn't it? Pruning and cleaning do a similar thing. That is, they're the removal of something for the good of that thing, right? So showering is the removal of, well, it's a good thing, isn't it? It's the removal of smell and dirt. And same with the pruning. It's good for the person. It's a benefit of, to them. And so Jesus encourages his disciples in this moment. He says, now you are clean, right? You are clean, right? By my word. So that's happened. You have been saved, I think. You have begun the Christian life. But the Father's work in you is not over. You have been clean, but you will go on being clean. You have been pruned. You will go on being pruned so that you produce more fruit. I did a search of just the ways that Jesus' words, because His word comes up in this passage a lot. The ways that the words of Jesus have been described in John's gospel. Just listen to this, because these things have become true for the disciples. And that's what Jesus is saying, I think. So chapter 5, verse 24, listen. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. That's what the word of Jesus does. Chapter 6, verse 63, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Chapter 8, verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. 8, verse 51, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. If you keep his word, you will never see death. 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him based on our response to the words of Jesus. And Jesus says to the disciples, you've received my word. You have been cleaned by my word. Verse 4 begins like this. Abide in me and I in you. At the very heart of the Christian life is union with Christ. Us in him and he in us. So Jesus is about to leave them. He's been telling them, I'm leaving. I'm departing from it. I'm going a place where you cannot come. And yet in this moment, he says, and abide in me. My departure does not mean we won't be abiding in one another. Abide in me and I in you. What does it mean to abide? Other translations have remain. Remain in me. It means to stay. It means to reside. It's, our, I think, our continuing fellowship with God. In a sense, you could say, Christ becomes our home. Like the context of our lives is Him. We are in Him. We've been united to Him in His death, so we die to sin. We have been united to Him in His resurrection, so we live resurrected from death in sin lives. In Christ, He's our home. We reside in Him. He, and then He takes up residence in us as well. Amazing. So how does our abiding in Christ happen? How do we do that? How do we practice that? Look down to verse 7. There's a couple of verses, I think, in this passage that give clues. Verse 7 says, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you. you know, Jesus had already said that. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Well, that's, that's the call, isn't it? Abiding in Christ, we cannot separate Christ from the revelation of Christ that He gives to us. You know, abiding in His words is to abide in Him. And then verse 10 also adds, look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So we want to abide in Christ, we want to abide in His love, and there's everything to do with abiding in His word and our obedience, our lives of joyful obedience to His word. You cannot say, I'm abiding in Christ and disobeying Him. It makes no sense. That's us abiding in Christ, but what about Jesus abiding in us? Well, you couldn't say it's exactly the same thing, could you? He doesn't have to obey our words. He doesn't have to abide in our words. But remember what we've seen already in chapter 14, that Jesus has spoken about how we will abide in us. It's the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm not leaving you as orphans, but I'm sending my Holy Spirit, and that is how Christ abides in us. So verse 4 continues, says, As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, well, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's not a super complicated picture, is it? It's pretty simple. And that's, it's good for simple people. 
so we like our country. You can imagine it, can't you? Easily imagine it, walking into your backyard, and there you see a branch just laying on the ground. Well, what's your reaction to that? You don't go, oh, this is exciting. Mm. I'm going to come back tomorrow and see what might happen from this branch. You don't do that, obviously. Why? It's obviously dead. There's no life in it. No life can come from it at all. It's not going to go, hmm, hope some apples come from this. wouldn't make any sense. We know, that in, we know that intuitively. And so it is for the person who wants spiritual fruit, but wants to kind of do it themselves, achieve it themselves. So you think, who would do that? Literally everyone who is not abiding in Christ. They assume, God will be fine with me. I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this. He ought to be very pleased. I've produced my own kind of fruit. I didn't need His fruit. I've got my own fruit. So they want to do it without genuine faith in the Lord. They want to do it without abiding in His Word, and without actual obedience to His Word, doing it on our own terms. And He will be pleased. And Jesus says that that person can do nothing. Well, of course, they can do some things, right? They can still probably ride a bike and get rich, I mean, bake a cake. They can do things. But when it comes to the things of heaven, when it comes to the things of pleasing God, when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to reconciliation with God, when it comes to being reconciled with God for now and all of eternity, when it comes to the things of eternal life, you can do exactly nothing. Nothing. And that's exactly the opposite of the Christian who abides in Christ. It says you will produce fruit. You will. Like night follows day, a healthy tree produces fruit. And so like night follows day, a Christian abiding in the vine, which is a healthy vine, it's Jesus Christ himself, will produce fruit. And because of that, I think, Jesus is saying, have joy. Take joy. Why? Christ is so near to you. You're like a branch to a vine. How close you are to Christ. He has brought you in. He is producing fruit in you. You are not left to your own strength. And the vine and the vine dresser are at work in your life to make that happen. So have joy. You might say, even this morning, you might be thinking, I don't have much fruit. I have but a very little, it seems, fruit. Well, what is a fruit a sign of? I'm, 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 I'm saying, be encouraged. You're alive. Fruit means alive. There's two categories. There's dead and alive. But amongst alive, there are varying degrees of fruit. But you cannot have fruit unless you are alive. Be encouraged. The amount of fruit you have today is not the amount of fruit that you need to have tomorrow. The vine and the vine dresser at work in you to produce more and more fruit. Isaiah 42, 3, a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. So go to verse 7 now, because we dealt with verse 6 already. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So this is an if-then clause. Again, we're describing the Christian life and it is glorious. An if-then clause. If you miss the if, you just go straight to the then, you're going to be in all kinds of trouble. Because the then part says, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That is a lot, that is, there's a lot of bad theology that comes out of that kind of thing. We're going to name it and we're going to claim it and we're going to kind of word faith it into existence, right? Well, that's no good. God is not a genie. Ask what you wish and he will, even genies have rules, right? Watch Aladdin, you'll know even genies have rules. But there is a condition here, right? What's the if? The if is so important. The if in this shapes the person asking. It shapes what the person will ask. It's if anyone abides in Christ. In His Word, the person who's abiding in obedience to His Word, what do you think that person asks for? What do they ask of the Lord? I think they're asking for the very same fruit in their lives that the Father and the, the vine dresser is wanting to create in their lives. That the branch 
becomes of the same mind as the vine, wanting and desiring these same things. Make me holy. Make me more like Christ. Prune away anything that robs me of joy in Christ. And if you are here this morning and you're like, well, that's disappointing. I was hoping for the other. I was hoping that when it said I could ask anything and God will give it to me, I was hoping for other things that I could ask for. Well, that's show probably indicative that you're not abiding in Christ. Maybe you're abiding in the world. Maybe you're abiding in your own selfish desires. But you've not been abiding in Christ so that He shapes the desires of your heart and the things that you would ask of the Lord. Abide in His Word and He will listen to your words. Verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Amazing. It's amazing to me because you look at our lives and you go, there's not much going on. Right? There's not, I don't know what, how your week was, but if you go, man, that was glory. You know, well, then that, that wasn't me, right? You, we just don't think of our lives like that. And yet, this is what Jesus says. By this is my Father, the Creator of the world, glorified. How? It's us bearing fruit in our lives, spiritual fruit. From abiding in His Word, obeying Him, and God is glorified. Now, that, I, I guess it does make sense in light of the metaphor, right? Because the metaphor is you've got a vine dresser and, well, he will be glorified if the vine produces fruit. You won't get on the front of kind of vine dressers magazine, monthly magazine, if you've got like a vine that has zero fruit. It's like, that's no good, no glory. But because there is fruit and God's at work amongst his people and God can say, my people are my glory, I glory in them. Look at them and just see my wisdom, see my love, see my forgiveness, see my kindness, see my unity, see all of these things. Look at my people. Look at the fruit of my son's work, work on the cross in redeeming these people for me. Look at them. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? That the Christian life is one that actually brings glory to God. Verse 9, Jesus says this, Oh man, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Another part of the Christian life, if you needed more. It's all done in the context of the love of Christ for you. And he parallels that, if you want to see what it's like, well, it's the way that the Father loves the Son, he says. How does the Father love the Son? Think of, how would you describe that love? Perfect? Eternal? Entirely, without ceasing, joy over. Jesus says, as the Father loves me, that's how I love you, entirely. Joy over, always, never ceasing. He takes pleasure in us, His people. So verse 10, Jesus says, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. He says, remain. I loved you. So now remain in my love. Show that. Keep my commandments. Follow me. Abide in the vine. Jesus parallels it again with the, Him and the Father. He says, it's just the same as, like, I joyfully keep my Father's commands and I stay in His love. Do the same. Do the same thing. That's our task together. Truman Baptist Church, let's us together abide in the love of Christ. It's a great, great calling for us, isn't it? Which is seen in our obedience to Him. That's why obedience can be joyful, isn't it? Because it flows from love. We're not obeying out of like obligation or earning or, or, or um, duty, just ju mere duty. But love, we are at home in Christ. He is in us. We are in Him. And we get to obey. So we come back to the last verse, which we, we mentioned at the very beginning, the purpose statement of it all. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Ultimately, what we're saying is joy is on offer this morning. In fact, infinite joy is on offer this morning. C.S. Lewis' famous quote, When infinite joy is offered us, he says, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. 
So that's the passage. I just want to summarize what we've seen just for a brief moment. Man, the Christian life, eh? The Christian life, it bears spiritual fruit. It does. It just does. It will. Every pruning that happens in your life is from the gentle and kind hand of God the Father. The Christian life. We've been cleansed by the words of Jesus. The Christian life abides in Christ. It receives from God everything that it asks for. The Christian life glorifies God the Father. Is loved by Jesus eternally and perfectly. And receives the very joy that Jesus has himself. That's a stunningly glorious calling, isn't it? I was thinking of this... um, uh, quote that I, I heard once from Agatha Christie. You know, Agatha Christie, the, the no- crime kind of mystery novel writer. She wrote this one. She said, I like living. I have sometimes been wildly, despairingly, acutely miserable, racked with sorrow. But through it all, I still know quite certainly that just to be alive is a grand thing. I love that. Just to be alive. To be alive, it just is a grand thing. I agree with that. Be alive is a grand thing. But if that's true, what is it to not just be alive, but to be alive spiritually with all of this? I mean, it's a grander thing, if that's a word. Isn't it? Isn't it a grand thing to be a Christian? I think it's just such a, a high calling and a glorious thing that fills our lives with such wonder to be a branch of this vine. So let's renew this morning our joy in abiding in Christ. Are you abiding in Christ? This passage, again, it brought to mind um, you know, David Brainerd. I'm bringing up all these names this morning, sorry. David Brainerd was a missionary in the 1700s to um, Native Americans. Um, and his story really motivated so much of, of modern missions and modern missionary movement because he wrote down his journal and Jonathan Edwards put together his journal and, and, and spread it out. He suffered a lot as a missionary. His body gave him great pain. His mind was prone to depression. He suffered immense discouragements along the way, lots of loneliness. But you might say, I think, that he was able to continue. He was able to endure because he abided in Christ. And you can see that in his, in his, 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 his journal. So his diary has moments like this. Spent almost the whole day in prayer incessantly. You know, or another day he says, Blessed be God, I had much freedom five or six times in the day in prayer and praise and felt a weighty concern upon my spirit for the salvation of those precious souls and the enlargement of the Redeemer's kingdom among them. On his 25th birthday, I don't know how you spent your 25th birthday. This is what David Brainard did. He said, Set apart this day for fasting and prayer to bow my soul before God for the bestowment of divine grace. So there's a reason why he did that so much, and he just abided in Christ so much intentionally. He wrote this, he said, Oh, the closest walk with God is the sweetest heaven that can be enjoyed on earth. Let me read that again. Do you know this? The closest walk with God is the sweetest heaven that can be enjoyed on earth. I think we know that experientially. I think we know that... If we have been abiding in Christ, our time with the Lord has been decreasing and we've more and more been relying on our own strength, then our joy diminishes, doesn't it? Because we're turning inward and, and we start essentially abiding in ourselves, which is ultimately the call that our whole society and the whole religion of our world is abide in yourself or abide in this or abide in that. It produces misery. It produces self-centeredness. So I'm not mainly saying this morning, run after joy, so much as I'm saying, run after Christ. Joy will come. But run after Him. The true vine, the the true Israelite, the true Israel, planted by God, who bears fruit, who did not deserve judgment, but did and was judged, was cut off for our sake. Run to Christ, who went to the cross and died for our sins and took the punishment that we deserve for all of our faithlessness, all of our abiding in other things, 
and took the punishment that we deserve for all of that on himself. I'm saying abide in the only one who's done that for you. Abide in the only vine that can give you life and life eternal. That's the Christian life at the, at the center, isn't it? Union with that, union with the Lord Jesus, the life-giving vine for God's people who are His branches. Let me pray.